All right, good morning. Good morning. All right, let's start off with a word of prayer before we get going on this. Father, we just can we just thank you for this opportunity to, mm, to give this word. Um, I need your help with this word. And I ask Holy Spirit that you'll just again come, have your way, guide what needs to be said and what doesn't need to be said. Hush, hush my mouth. Hide me behind the cross. No one sees me, but they see Jesus. In the precious holy name of Jesus, I pray and ask, amen. Today's word is... What does it say? You almost persuaded. You almost persuaded me. You almost persuaded me. I'm moving this thing out of the way because this word is going to get really intense. So if you're watching online, you're watching online, if you're watching online, hang on tight for the whole thing. You need to listen through the whole thing. Some of you get in there and you scroll in there for one second and then you log back off. This is going to be something that's going to either, it's going to change your life one way or another. Whether you're going to pay attention or not. It's going to be your choice because it says like this, you almost persuaded me. I'm here to persuade you on something that is life and death in your life. It's life and death in your life. I don't care how old you are. If you're 12 years old, 16 years old, 25 years old, 27 years old, 57 years old. I don't care what you are, where you are, what you've been through, what your history is, what's happened to your past. I don't care. What I care about is right now and where you're going to go in the future when you die. This is where my understanding is where so many people have a problem with God. They got a problem with this, with with things that happened in the church or with somebody who was treated me some way. They hurt my feelings. Woe is me. But in reality, you're in a sinful state before a holy God and in that When you die and you're not right with God, according to the word of God, you'll be sentenced to second death, which is hell. So I'm here to give you two stories. Two stories. One is a story that I heard personally from a pastor that I sat with him and we did this funeral of a good friend of mine who died at the age of 24 from a drug overdose. This young lady who sat on my front porch and I had this conversation with and her lifestyle and the way she was living this lifestyle away from God and she was convicted of it. She said so, but she had this trouble getting away and breaking free from this drug addiction. <coughs> Excuse me. We prayed a prayer. She asked Jesus to save her. She handed me a bag of Coke and walked off the porch. Within several months later, I was standing over her body in a casket, preaching her funeral. The church we were in was another pastor. He was the senior pastor was of True Temple, was the name of the church. And the pastor was named Garland Falls. I so respect this man because he taught me so much that day. And as it was his turn to give a little uh, message to the people, he gave this message and he gave this sermon, uh, this message of understanding that one day that he was preaching at his church, excuse me, he was preaching at his church and he told this story that really happened. Now I want you to pay attention to this story. Then the next story that I'm going to give you is I'm going to read the story from the Bible. Because I need you to listen. I need to persuade you to understand. You're at a point in your life you need to make a choice. Because you are not guaranteed the rest of today. I don't care who you are or how old you are, whether you think you're above it all or not. The, the pastor, Pastor Falls, got up there and this is what he said. He started the sermon this one Sunday and as he was preaching, the, the sermon already got started, the, the church service already got started. He started preaching and three young men came in and sat in the very back pew. They just caught, it caught his eye very much at the point. Then he felt really the Spirit of God come upon him to kind of change some things in his sermon. And so he started preaching more about salvation. 
He started telling them about their need for Christ. The sermon went on for about 40 minutes or so, and, and, and he gave scriptures, and he showed the way, and then he got down, and, and, and if, you, if you've ever been to an old school church, or maybe a smaller church, they always give what you call an altar call. It's a time to make a decision, where you come down to the altar, you repent of your sins, and you give your life to Christ. He's an old school, which, which we, this is where we all need to go back to. We need to all go back to this old school type of, of preaching that we have an altar call every time because we don't know who thinks that they're following Christ are really going to die in their sins and go to hell. You think you're a Christian, but if you died right now, you'd end up smack dead in hell and everybody would be saying, how'd you get here? I thought you were a follower of Christ. You used to go to church every Sunday. But you never, never gave your life over to Christ. You may have prayed a prayer to ask to be saved because you didn't want to go to hell. But you never made Jesus Lord of your life. So here the pastor's going on and he's telling his story. He's preaching and he gives the altar call. He makes everybody stand up. He has the, the person who plays the, the, the piano play a little soft tune and, and sing a little song of, of, of come, come to the altar And he really felt the Spirit of God come to say to him, them three boys need salvation. Keep going until they come down. And as he kept trying to plead with them, you need to repent of your sin. You need to be saved today. He could see that they were holding, this is where we get the, the, the saying, white knuckling it. They were holding the front of the pew so tight because they weren't going to budge from their decision that they, didn't, they were not going to ask Jesus to save them. You could see their, he said, I could see their knuckles change colors as they were holding on to the pew in front of them. I was like, wow, this is, man, this is getting intense. And he's pleading with them, pleading with them. And he said, then he felt this peace of God come upon him and he said, it's, it's over, it's done with. They made their choice. He gave a little prayer, and as he said, amen, all three men, young men, got out of the pew as quickly as they came in and went straight out the back door. He didn't even get a chance to go up and introduce himself to them and say, hey, how you doing? I'm Pastor Falls. You know, who invited you? How, why did you come today? You know, you came in late. You know, it's really great. I'm glad you came, no matter if you came late or not. I'm glad. He didn't get to do none of that. It was like that moment in time of him pleading with them as they sat there. He's up here on this stage and he's pleading them, this is the time to get saved. This is the time to ask Jesus Christ to be born again. This is the time to give your life over. Repent of your sins and be born again. And they refused it and walked out the door. You would think that was the end of the story. But it wasn't. So he went along like he, he said, I just went, as I usually do, I greet everybody that came that, that, for that service. And, you know, and they, everybody left. And me and my wife, he said, me and my wife, we, we always close up the church and we lock it all up. And then we head on home. Sometimes we go out to eat. And sometimes we just go straight home. But th this evening here, we felt we were just going to go straight home. You know, and then we, we would spend the rest of our evening at home together. And as they were driving down the street on their way back to the house, they saw a police car with the lights on. They saw an ambulance with the lights on. And they saw a car flipped upside down. He said, I looked to my wife and said, we got to stop. I need to pray for the whoever's in this accident. I need to go pray for them, make sure they're okay. I want to pray that God will touch them to make them okay. She said, sure, that would be fine. That would be fine, honey. That would be fine. And they pulled off to the side of the road and he got out. As he walked over to closer to the accident, one body laying in the grass. And one of the guys from the ambulance was covering him up. As he walked in, he says, is he okay? Can I pray for him? He said, no, he's dead. He says, and the other guy over there in the car, he's dead too. There's only one, and he don't look like he's going to make it, and they're putting him in the ambulance right now. 
He goes, I just, I'm a pastor and I just wanted to pray for him. You know, that'll be okay. He goes, well, you're going to have to follow the ambulance because they're rushing him. And they were, they shut the doors. He says, uh, they were shutting the doors with him in it. And I just decided in my heart, man, I needed to pray for this young man because I recognized the body that was there. It was the body of the man who stood in the very back who, who, who just rushed out of there. And then I looked in the car of the other dead body and it was the other one. So I knew, I knew, I knew. That the guy that was in the ambulance was the third one. This is the passion that he's telling this story. As this coffin was sitting there before him. And I sat over there onto the side. Knowing that I had to talk with that young lady the same way. At 24 years old, she's dead and in the coffin. Now he's telling this story about these three young men. And they're dead. Two of them are dead and one's severely and they're saying he's not going to make it. He grunts and he gets into the car. He says, honey, we got to follow that ambulance. We got to follow that ambulance. So he's speeding behind the ambulance and he's like, and he's praying the whole time, God, please, please have mercy. God, please, please save this young man. Please give him another chance. God, please. And the wife's praying and agreement's right, right beside him. And as this pastor is telling the story, I feel the pain in his heart. I still feel today, whenever this story comes to my heart, I hate this story. And he pulls up behind the ambulance. And they open up the door. He comes over wanting to pray for him. And the boy is dead. He's dead. His eternity is set. He had a chance and he made his choice. As many of you, as I have self, my, as for my, me, myself, I have always the, the same. How even for myself, I should have been dead how many times? I tell my stories, I tell my stories, I tell my stories, and I tell my stories. And some of you people, you're watching online and you're sick of my stories. Well, good, I'm glad you're sick of my stories. Then go watch somebody else and listen to somebody else. Because I'm tired of telling my stories. Because I'm trying to persuade, I'm trying to persuade you. There is life after death and your choice is going to either send you to hell or send you to heaven. And I cannot break your arm to persuade you to follow Jesus. I can't do it. I can't do it. Just as much as it's heavy on my heart, as it was heavy on that pastor's heart, and he wanted to go over there and drag that boys to the altar, it would have done no good. None. Because you're going to make up your mind. You're either going to listen and make up your mind to follow Christ, or you're going to listen and say, I'm out. That's what you're going to do. Let me show you. There's this guy in Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. There's this guy. His name is Paul. He's one of the greatest writers in the Bible. I love him because... He was a wicked man, but he thought he thought he was good. He thought he was a good he was a good follower of God. He loved God. He followed all the rules of God. He memorized the first five books of the Bible. He loved to do things for God. He thought he was doing God favor in some of the things that he was doing. He heard about this Jesus that it was said he was claimed to be the Messiah. He heard about this Jesus who died on the cross and then he raised from the dead. But here was his thoughts. You know what? I'm going to um, I'm going to say that's not the Messiah. This is wrong. He, and I'm going to stand by God and I'm going to do a favor for the church. For the church. I'm going to take one for the church. And I'm going to be ugly and mean for all the people that are following this Jesus. And I'm going to persecute them. I'm going to treat them bad. I'm going to kill them. And I'm going to do this. And, and this is the church. This is the bloody church of today in America. We think we're right. 
And young men and women are dying and going to hell. Old men and women are dying and going to hell. Children are dying and going to hell. And we don't give a bloody squat. But Paul has this encounter. He thinks he's doing right. And we're going to read about his own testimony in a second here. Because I'm going to read the whole story. I'm not going to just tell you about it. I'm going to let, you, I'm going to let you, him tell you his story. But he had an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus said, you know what? I got a problem with you. You are doing things to my people that are wrong. And in that, you've got a choice. Either you're going to figure out that I'm God, and my, I am God it, it, incarnate and in this flesh, and you're going to follow me, or me and you've got a problem. Why? Because all through the word, God says eventually he's going to stand up for his people, and he's going to bring justice for his people at one time or another. Whether it be through your death, because you're acting evil towards others that are followers of Christ, or because of your rebellion, and you just say you said no, the end results will be justice of your sin against the holy God. But Paul recognizes the power of Jesus Christ and he says, I submit to you, to your Lord. And he turns his life over and he makes his decision. Now in this decision, he ends up going down paths of roads and he runs into more people like he was. The Bible also says, whatever you sow, you shall reap. Understand that. You sow ugly and ugly words, you will receive ugly and ugly words back. Even though Paul repented of his sins, but the same aspects that he tortured the church, the church tortured him. And this is where we're at. He's preaching Jesus Christ. He went through this long journey. He's preaching Jesus Christ. And the church has him arrested. And they bring him before the, the courts of the Roman Empire. And they're trying to get the Roman Empire, just like they got Jesus, they, they, they got Jesus to be murdered on the cross. But Jesus didn't get murdered on the cross. He laid down his life. And then they killed him. They were trying to do the same thing to Paul. Now, Paul has an opportunity to share the gospel with a lot of people, and especially to one, the attention of one, and that's a king. Let me read his story. Acts chapter 26, verse 1. Acts chapter 26, verse 1. Hang in there, listen on. Don't be keep scrolling. Don't keep scrolling. You need to listen to this. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak. For yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things which I am accused of by the Jews, especially before because you are um, expected or, or an expert because you are an expert in all cons, uh, customs questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg to you, I beg you to hear my petition. So Paul is saying right off the bat, he's saying, "Listen, King." You're an expert in the laws of the land. You're a very wise man, but I'm going to give my petition to you that you understand that these laws and everything that the Jews are doing, I want you to be on, on point about this. So he's pleading with the king. Hear me and listen to me good. Listen to every word. And this is where I'm at with you today. You need to listen to every word I have because it may be the last time you ever hear me speak. Verse 4. My manner of life from my, my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation of J Jerusalem. All the Jews know. They, they knew me from the first if they were willing to testify that according to the strict, strictest sect of, of our religion, I live a Pharisee. 
And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our twelve tribes earnestly serve God night and day. Hope to attain, attain for the, this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raised the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So this I also did in Jerusalem. Many of the saints I shut up in prison. I have received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often to every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. You hear his testimony of what he did wrong? He's saying, I did this for the church. I persecuted them. I vote for them. I voted for them to be killed. This is where Stephen came in the very first time. If you ever look up the, the story about Stephen, Stephen was preaching about Jesus Christ being dead and raised from the dead, and we need to follow him, make him Lord of our lives. And they, they voted for him to be put to death, and they drug Stephen outside the, of, the, of, the, the, of the city. And Paul held everybody's coats while he watched everybody throw stones at, at Stephen and kill him. And Paul is saying, this is what I did. Do you, do you hear me, people? This is what I did. I was a bad person. This is for me to say to you. I was a pastor before I was a pastor. I was a, I was a follower of Jesus before I was a follower of Jesus. I was a sinner. I sinned in these things. I looked at pornography. I, did, I committed fornication. I cussed. I disobeyed my parents. I dishonored God. I never went to church. I never did these things. I, I broke every Ten Commandments. I lied. I stole. I did every Ten Commandments. I broke every Ten Commandments, every, all of them. That's who I was. Then in 1998, I had an encounter with Jesus Christ in a hotel room. I realized he was giving me a second chance. And in that second chance, I repented of my sins. And I said, I'm going to make you Lord. And I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. So whether it is that this now, that, that the things that are happening in, in your life or in my life, you have a chance to say, today I make God my, I make Jesus Christ my Lord. It's your choice. Here, Paul made his choice, but he's telling you his past because he wants you to understand where he came from to where he is now. I am here now to tell you, no matter what happens, I'm still going to follow God. I'm still going to make Christ my, my, my Lord in my life. I'm going to follow him no matter what happens. No matter what happens. Whoever you are in my life, it doesn't matter. I'm following Christ. You either come with me or you stay. I'm still following Christ. It's what it's going to be. What about you? Where are you? So Paul reads on, verse 12. And while they thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, along the, the road, I saw a light from the heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. To make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jews, Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I, know, I now send you. To open their eyes in order to turn them from their darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. 
that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, listen, Paul, I'm going to choose you that you're going to stand before both Jews and Greek. They're going to accuse you, but I want you to bring to them an understanding. There is a purpose of time. Now, you are to repent and put Jesus Christ first. He's getting the opportunity to meet Jesus right one-on-one. -on -one. For many of us, we're not going to ever get the chance to meet Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to hear the words of a pastor, an evangelist, or maybe a friend who's going to stand there and say to you, I love you, but in your sin, you will die and go to hell. And I don't want that. I care about you. It doesn't matter what's happened in your past. It doesn't matter what, what you feel like, who you're mad at. It doesn't matter none of that. It matters when you die in your sin against the holy God, you'll be judged and sentenced to hell. And Jesus is saying, I want to provide a way for everyone to have a chance not to do this choice. So I must send somebody to give this word. And so I send you, Paul, to do this. Right now he's sending, he's sending me. If you happen to stay on this line and not scroll by, then great. Hang on because we're not done yet. The heaviness that, that Paul must have been feeling at the time. To listen to Jesus Christ saying, I want to use you even though you were a dirt bag. You hurt people. You kill people. But you thought you was a good person, and you weren't. Paul, you knew all the words of the Bible. You memorized the first five books. You knew them by heart. And you still was a dirt ball that you were hurting my people. And now that you're hurting my people, I'm coming up against you. Be careful who you come against. <clears throat> you might come up against. You might come against someone that Jesus has got his hand on to do a work. And in that, you're coming up against the wrong person because Jesus is going to come and visit you and give you a chance. You better stop or he's going to put you down. Don't believe me? It's in the book. There was a prophet. These kids were making fun of it. Kids were making fun of this prophet. They were calling him baldy. And so the, the man of God says, be cursed, you, you young kids. And two she-bears came out of the woods and killed every kid. It didn't say young man. It didn't say young adult. It didn't say man. It said kids. I don't care who you are. The word of God is true through and through. Where you come from? What background happened to you? You were maybe raised in a church and you got church hurt. Free with that church hurt. You're going to die, go to hell. Let me read on. Verse 24. Now as, thus made, <clears throat> now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. That's what a lot of people think about me. I'm crazy. I heard one somebody say something about you. You, 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 you're, you, you. You're always posting stuff about Scripture on, on your Facebook page. You're always putting that Scripture on there. Ain't you a little bit doing too much? No, if you died right now, are you going to go to heaven or hell? I think I'm going to go to heaven. Really? You shouldn't know you're going to heaven. Who out there that I'm going to send this to might reach that day that might reach that day? And change their life. I'm in turmoil here. To walk up to somebody and says, I don't care, I just want my way, it bothers me. When the Word of God says to love your neighbors, love God first, love your neighbors, and love your enemies. And we as a people, followers of Christ, can't do that. We can't. We just can't. And I'm sitting there going, God, if we can't do that, we're doomed. We're all doomed. Let's see what else Paul's got to say. As he pleads his case, he's pleading for these guys to change their mind. Change your mind, I'm telling you. Think about it. Just think about it. 
Verse 25. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the word of truth and reason. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escaped his attention. Since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. It's really interesting how one guy wants to intercede and call Paul mad and crazy. And at the same time, he's, he, and Paul's redressing, redirecting him and saying, but this is not to you, Festus. This is to the king. I'm directing this to the king. I'm understanding, king, do you believe what the prophets say in the holy book? And Paul knows how much this king, Agrippa, believes the book. He's already done his research about this king because he watches the king in his actions. So he says, I know you, king. I know you believe this. And I say the same thing to you right now. I know you know this book. I know you know you believe this book. But also, do you understand? In Romans, it talks about that... that That even the demons believe in Jesus Christ. Read some of the stories. As Jesus would walk up on the scenes, many of the, the demons would say, Jesus, why are you here? You here to throw us in, in, and torture us now? Please don't torture us now. They recognized Jesus. Jesus didn't even have to introduce himself. They knew who he was immediately. <coughs> then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. What? And this is where we get the titles. The king's listening to his words. And he's saying, you know what, Paul? You almost persuade me to be a Christian. What is your excuse? Why is these words not persuading you to follow Jesus Christ? What is going on to that I cannot persuade you to see the truth that Jesus died for your sins, that you can be born again, changed from the inside. Your, everything in your life is going to change. You'll find peace. You'll find joy that you, you've, you're, you're like, I'm never happy. I'm, never, I'm always sad. I'm always this going on. You know why? Because you keep, oh, help me, Holy Spirit, help me. You keep on rejecting because you want your way you want the things in your life that you want to do you're going to put it off one too many times and and it's going to be too late just like that girl that sat in that coffin at 24 years old just like those three young men who sat in the back and listened to the last words at, at, that to come and be born again and they walked out the door and down the street they died in a car wreck what is it that to today for you you're going to click off of this thing. You're going to click off of this thing right here. You're going to walk out these doors and it might be your last day and you'll see eternity. How else can I beg you to see the truth and accept the truth and persuade you to follow Jesus Christ? As much as I would love to twist your arm and make you, I can't do that. All I can do is say, I love you. I, I love you. I love you. I care about you. I don't know why you're hurt so bad. But he's the answer. He's the answer. But for some of you, you're going to be just like this king. You almost persuaded me. I almost did it. And you made your choice right there, right now. You have sentenced yourself to be doomed when your life is over and you will spend eternity in hell. Verse 29. <laughs> And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all that hear me today might become both almost 
and altogether such as I am. Except for these chains. What he's saying here is, listen, I want you to be like me to follow Christ, except for I don't want you to be in chains just because that's part of the mission to tell others about Jesus. You see, sometimes some people have to go through some crap because that crap is what's going to bring them before the right person that will show them Jesus and they're going to get born again. But Paul's saying, if everything else, I don't want you to go to jail for Jesus. I don't want you to be in chains for Jesus. I just want you to be like, I, I am in passionate love for Jesus because he saved me from my sins. I was a wicked, wicked person. I thought I was good. I thought I was doing favor. To, I, I thought I was a good person. I thought I was doing the right things according to the church, according to God. I, I, but, but I found out different. And the truth was, I sinned, and my sentence would be eternal life in hell. But Jesus said, I'm going to let you hear me one time. Listen to me, Paul. Now Paul is saying to them, and, and he was addressing just the king, but in that he changed that address to everyone that's for everyone sitting here, everyone scrolling on the t TikTok, everyone scrolling on the Facebook and the YouTube. It, it, it's to all of you. You need to listen. Listen good. This might be your last chance to repent and be born again. And I'm pleading with you. If there's anything that's causing a hesitation, you're, you're not saying yes, you're not saying no right yet. It's to say for you to go ask God. I got questions, or I'm angry, or I've got, I, I, I'm bitter, or I, I have this problem, or I have this problem. This person said this person. I'm saying, this is a sinful world. It's a broken world. There's going to be problems, but the only one is going to get us through, the, to, through this world and to the end and to see heaven on earth is through Jesus Christ to be born again. There is an eternity of hell to walk away from. And it's by choosing Christ, not just to be born again, to pray a prayer so I don't have to go to hell. It's to say, I choose Christ and make him Lord of my life that I may follow him. Verse 30. As then when he said these things, the king stood up and as well as the governor and, and Bernice and those who sat with him. And when they had gone aside, they talked amongst themselves this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been this man had met, might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. One last chance. I plead with you, just as Paul pleaded with those people. And he pleads with us again because of his writings. The writings of, of what, I've uh, what I have read are now recorded on a video. That they may go on just like this word goes on in this living book right here. The Holy Bible. And for some of you, it may be just that one last chance you read this word and you make the choice. Nah, I'll wait until I'm 30. Or I'll wait until I have to have my fun first. I remember this one pastor, his testimony was, he wanted to go play professional baseball. He was good at it. But God called him to be a preacher and he said, no, nah, I'm going to play baseball. And so one day as he was, right, he was right, uh, uh, doing something with the mower and he was mowing the grass, something happened and he slipped and the mower fell over and it cut his toe off. Do you think God's going to go drastic measure to get you to follow him that many will be saved? I think so. He did it for Paul. He made Paul blind. Scared the living daylights out of him. To understand that he's God. We're not. And if we don't submit 
will be judged and sentenced far away from Him and be in torment for the rest of our lives. That's, not, that's a crazy God. Why would I want to serve someone like that? Because He's the Creator. He created everything. Whether you believe it or not, whether you want to battle in your mind and make your excuses up there, the, the, the design of all nature, not a human, not a big bang boom could have happened to create it only a God that existed always and now and always to come created everything. And he is the one that can say to my creation, I choose to destroy it. He, he, he almost did in the flood with, with Noah. And it's coming again because in Revelations, he brings judgment again. He's bringing hail, fire, brimstone. He's bringing diseases. He's bringing pestilence. He's bringing all kinds of stuff for us to see that he is God. Just like he did with, with Israel in, in, in Egypt. He's going to bring the same thing so that understandably, unrecognizably, He is the true and living God, whether you believe it or whether you don't. But again, I plead with you. This is your, might be your last chance. Just like that pastor who stood there and watched those three men grip their chair. Grip the chair. They were like this. They were, they, they, they were just gripping that chair. I'm like, and I know, God, I'm supposed to go up there. I know I'm supposed to go up there. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And now five minutes later, they were dead down the road. Your choice. Again, you may never hear me and ever again. You may ever, never see me on your feet ever again. You may never, ever, ever hear me plead for you. Jesus, 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 Jesus died on the cross. He died on the cross. For the wrong you have done against the holy God. You've told lies. You've disobeyed your parents. You've gossiped. You've rejected Him. You've created gods to suit your lifestyle. Those are sin against the holy God. And the only way to be forgiven of those sins is to accept the sacrifice that Jesus died on the cross for you. Because you cannot be good enough. You cannot pay enough money into the offering. You cannot roll enough beads and pray enough repentance words. You cannot do any of that to receive salvation. It's only to recognize the debt was paid. I recognize Jesus is the one who paid it. Forgive me of that sin, God. I believe what Jesus died on the cross for was for my sin debt. I believe that. I believe you raised him from the, the, the grave and now he sits at the right hand with you and he, will, he is king and Lord over all the earth. I believe that. Now I put my trust in him and him alone. And I will, make he, he, I will make him Lord over my life. Whatever he teaches me in this book, I will do, I will follow. Faith without works is dead. That's my faith. What I learn, I will do. I'm done. So here's your chance. This is an altar. Where you're at, you're online. Your altar is right there in front of you. I don't care who's with you watching it beside you. I don't care who's where you're at. This is between you and God right now. It's right now. I don't have no fancy music. I, don't, I have a set of drums with nobody to play them. I have a piano. I got nobody to play it. There's none of that. It's between you and God right now. It's the choice. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I gave my life to Christ in 1998 in a hotel room. Maybe you're in a room right now. Maybe you're in your house right now. Maybe you're right here in this church. I'm going to close in prayer, and this is the time. You need to make things right between you and God. This is the time. It may be your last time. I pray not. But I'm not taking anything for granted anymore. Our world is going to hell in a handbasket because the prophecies that were preached about in Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Revelation are happening right now. We're in the end of the end times. Judgment is coming. Judgment is here. 
What about you? What about you? Bow your heads. Father, I come to you in the precious holy name of Jesus again to thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. Uh, stand on the words of Isaiah that this word will go forth and it will accomplish the things wherein to it is sent. To each person who stayed engaged to listen to what was said. As King Agrippa did, he listened to every word that Paul said. And he said, I was almost persuaded to be a Christian, to follow Jesus. But he chose not to. I have pleaded with these people. I have begged them. I have given the words. I have read your word. I have given stories. I have done what all I can do. I can't do no more. I'm spent. Holy Spirit, the rest is on you. The word of God says if we lift up Jesus, God, you said you will draw men unto you. So I'm holding you to your word right now that everyone who stayed and listened and who paid attention, that right now you will reach down from heaven and grab their heart and draw them to the cross. Maybe in this point right now, I ask that Jesus, that you would maybe just, just as you did to Paul, you showed up on a road when they were doing their wrong and you had a conversation with them one on one. Jesus, will you do that for everyone that's listening? Anyone that's far away from you, would you go please visit them one on one? How am I to know unless I ask? So I'm asking. I, I want to see no one die and perish in eternal life. I want to see no one die and perish in eternal life. But for whether the sins we have sinned against you, first off, the sin that we have created another God and not followed you as God, for the sin that we have taken your name in vain. For the sin that we have rejected you. For the next sin, we have, we have disobeyed our parents. We have rebelled against our parents. We have dishonored our parents. Your word says that if we honor our father and our mother, we will be given long life. No wonder so many young people are dying at a young age. We have sinned. It says bear, not to bear false witness, to lie against others. We have lied against others. We have lied on ourselves. We have lied on you. We have lied against other people. It says thou shalt not steal. We have taken things that have not been ours. It says thou shalt not murder. Jesus, you said if we even hate our brothers or have hate in our heart, we commit murder to them. Your word says, that we should not commit adultery. Jesus, you said, if we look at someone with lust, we have committed adultery in our hearts. You have taken from the action of what is put our hands on and do it with our bodies to the intent of our hearts through what we look through with our eyes and desire in our mind and our heart that we sin against you. That's how holy and high standard that you put us in. We are guilty. We are guilty. Your word says in, 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 in Hebrews that if we have broken one of these rules, we've broken them all. That's your standard. For myself, I've broken all ten. Not even to get into the 600 that the Jews made and how many laws that, the, the, that America has. Just to say the, the, the ten that you gave, I broke all ten of them. I'm guilty. I'm a sinner. And I'm lost and I'm dying going to hell. But according to your word, you made a way that I would not have to go to hell. According to what you sent Jesus for was to die on the cross for my sins. You gave a gift to me. And right now I want to accept that gift. I want to be saved. I want to be a, I want to be a new person. I want your Holy Spirit to come in me and make me a new person. I want to follow your life. I want to do what you want it done. I'm making you Lord of my life. You have to say so. 
If I'm going somewhere or doing something you don't like, then shut it down. I don't, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to be a part of it. I want to follow you. All I want is you. Hear your prayers. Hear the prayers of these people. Wherever they're at. In the hotel room, in the apartment. In their car. Wherever they're at, hear their prayer. As they call out to you to be saved. Maybe some of them are calling out to you to be healed right now. Jesus, you talk about this healing. That there's a portion for us. So I ask for this portion of healing for your people. For the brokenhearted. For the one who's suffering with the cancer. For the one who's suffering with the blood pressure, the diabetes, the kidney disease. The one who has the headaches and the headaches won't go away. I'm asking for your portion to show yourself real. It's not me. I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. You are everything. You are everything. To heal these people, to show them you're real. You showed yourself to Paul to change his life. I'm asking you to show yourself to these people to change their life. I stand like John who, who walks up to the man with the, with the man is standing there and he's begging for money. He's begging for money. How many people keep calling me and begging for money? I don't have any money. But all I have is you to give to them. God, will you show up like you did on that road that they reached out and they gave him Jesus and that man's hand got better. He got up and carried his mat off. Can't do this. Can't do this without you. Can't do this without you. I'm a nobody. I am a nothing. You are everything. We please make a difference. Please make a difference. Please show up in these people's lives. I saw this in Jesus' name. Amen. That's all I have. Have a good day.